Good to see so many of you up early on Saturday morning after such a late Friday. Or, or, no, it's Friday morning. I don't even know what day it is. Yeah, uh, uh, on uh, Friday morning after such a late Thursday night. So it's, uh, it's great to see you all here. Well, Chris is, is right, of course. C.S. Lewis is controversial because on the one hand, he's one of the greatest authors of the last century, one of the greatest Christian authors, most widely read, uh, very influential, uh, very much of an impact on, on, in a sense, Western civilization. Uh, but on the other hand, as Christians who really believe firmly in the inerrancy of Scripture, there are things we have to disagree with Lewis about because there are a variety of things where he was not as obviously and strongly committed to the word of God as we are. And there are areas where he was willing to hope for some doctrines that are a little odd. And so, yeah, there are things about Lewis that are controversial, but there are also a lot of things that, that we can learn from him. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that he wrote a fair amount about is the question of education. And so that's something we're going to talk about today. We've got Christ and culture. One of the important things about culture is how people are, are educated, how they're inculturated, as you, as you might say, uh, or how they're socialized, how they're uh, equipped to be part of a culture or to deal with a culture. So Lewis has a few things to say about that. I don't know if I agree with all of them, but I'm going to talk to you about some of them. And this is, is supposed to be about C.S. Lewis and great books education. So that's specifically what I'm going to address. And there are a few areas where Lewis is, is kind of leaving a gap. I think I know from reading all of his books what he would say if I had him here and I asked him specifically about it. But on the other hand, there are some things he just doesn't, doesn't say clearly. But I can give you the areas on either side of that, and I think we can kind of project what would be the likely thing that would fill in the middle. So this is what I'm going to try to do today. So uh, my talk is entitled, C.S. Lewis and the Great Books, Seeing Things as They Really Are Through the Eyes of the Ages. Now, Lewis's own experience was that books had a huge impact on his life. Uh, he talks about how from a young age he was surrounded by books and he had a lot of quiet places in which to read. And he spent a lot of time reading, even as a, a, a child. And so he was very familiar with the world of books. One of the things I envy about him is he had a photographic memory. So he actually remembered everything he read. He said, well, you know, that's a disadvantage too because there are some things I'd like to forget that I've read, but I can't. But uh, on the other hand, I, I think there's probably, if you're careful what you read, it would be useful to remember all of it. Uh, books helped lead Lewis to Christ. Uh, he found Christ in all of the best books. And this is interesting because even in books that were not written by Christians, Lewis actually found somehow information that led him closer to God was still in those works, which is an interesting idea. Lewis says in Surprised by Joy, all the books were beginning to turn against me. This is when he was still fighting against God. And he said, the most religious authors were the ones on whom I could really feed. The others seemed tinny. So here he is. He's still an atheist or an agnostic. He's reading all these books, and all of the books are leading him to God. And the only books, that, the books that are, are in rebellion against God and that support his rebellion, the longer he reads them, the more he thinks, you know, this is just junk. But this is what I think I believe. These other books... I don't agree with these people about God, but this is the stuff that's really meat and potatoes that feeds my soul. So Lewis was in this strange situation, and of course the Holy Spirit drew him, and eventually he 
he gave in, you know. God called him and, uh, and reeled him in. And so he, uh, he became a believer. He says in Christian Reflections, if you wish to avoid God, you, you must read books, select them very carefully, but you'd be safer to stick to the papers. So he suggests that if you read books, they're likely to influence you toward God, whether you, you expect that or not. That you, you, The better thing to do if you want to remain an atheist is not to read anything except the newspapers. <clears throat> so Lewis is very much a literary man. He's very much in favor of books. But now, if we're going to talk about great books education, exactly what is a great book? That's a, a question that Lewis addresses. He's actually really generous in his definition of what a, a great book is, maybe too generous. He uh, suggests in his book an experiment on criticism, whatever has been found good by those who really and truly read probably is good. Wow, wow, that's really generous. So he's saying that what determines a good book isn't the content of the book, it directly, it's how people read that book. And this is, we'll get into more of this. This is kind of an unusual concept. He says, ideally, we would define a good book as one which permits, invites, or compels good reading. But we shall have to make do with permits or invites, says Having it compel good reading, uh, I don't know if I can really say that a book compels you to read it properly. But what does he mean by good reading? Well, he says reading as reception. Uh, Lewis claims that you need to take a book on its own terms, that you have to just receive it as it is and examine what the author is communicating to you. So he's taking a very anti-postmodernist stand. He doesn't believe in projecting his own ideas onto the book. Uh, he instead believes in, in receiving what the author is saying. He says that, that good reading involves a passionate and constant love of the works that you read. And so if you're going to love these books, that's, that's one of the things that makes it a great book, is if it's a book that you can love passionately. And he says, good readers reread books. If you read a book and you think, well, I'm never going to read that again, well, it's probably not a great book. A great book is one that invites readers to reread that book throughout their lives. Uh, Lewis also says what good reading is not, and he gives us three things. He says it's not passing time. People who read books just to use up time, that's not really good reading. And the sorts of literature they gravitate toward is not, therefore, usually to be considered great. He also says it's not seeking excitement. He says often good books are exciting. And Lewis likes things like adventure stories. He lo loves Robert Louis Stevenson, by the way, one of his favorite authors. And uh, he loves books that are exciting, but the reason you read a book shouldn't be just to seek excitement. If that's really your only reason, then you're not really reading it as a good reader, and it isn't really a great book if that's all it does. And he points out that, that once you've read a book just for the roller coaster ride, you're probably not ever going to read it again if that's what it was all about because now you know all the surprises and all the, the, the things that happen. And so if you're reading just for excitement, it sort of spoils it for you to read it again. But Lewis says, again, remember, good readers read the same books over and over again. So it's interesting. And then last, he says, good reading is not reading things in order to facilitate egoistic castle building. That's his phrase, egoistic castle building. What is that? Well, when you think about some kind of a, uh, of a fantasy world for yourself and, you know, you imagine yourself, I don't know, what kinds of crazy things do I imagine? You imagine yourself as president of the United States 
or, uh, or you know, emperor of the Western Hemisphere, or uh, the richest man in the world, you know, those kinds of things. And some people read books in order to feed that. You know, they read books about wealthy, powerful people in order to sort of put themselves in the shoes of the wealthy, powerful person. And Lewis says, to a degree, it's okay that you put yourself in the shoes of the person in the book. That's actually probably good. But if you're doing it just to feed your own fantasies, your own fantasy life, that's not really good reading either. Now, I admit, I've been guilty of this, you know, imagining yourself as a a swashbuckler in the 17th century, you know, fighting against the abuses of the Inquisition at the, on the high seas and that sort of thing, you know. That's not really good reading per se. Uh, so Lewis says it's got to be more than that. So that's what a, a good book is going to be, a book that we can read well, that we can really receive it, that we want to reread it, that we love the book passionately. And if any one of us treats any book that way, Lewis is willing to say, well, you know, it's probably a good book because, you know, Mr. Smith, Mr. Sanchez, you know, Mr. Abaya, they say this is a good book. They, they read it. They love it. They're interested in it. They reread it. I accept that, he says. And so that's his idea of what a great book can be. So then what are we doing in education? If we've got great books, which isn't apparently hard for them to be great, exactly what is it about education? And what would it mean to have education that focused on the great books? Well, I think there are a variety of purposes for education that Lewis hints at throughout his writings. So for example, one of them is to discover what is universal and what is not that it's helpful for you to know more about the rest of mankind and what humans have thought and experienced throughout the ages. And so, for example, when we do that, we discover, lo and behold, all human beings seem to know the moral law. You know, modern sociologists are fond of telling you, oh, well, everyone has all these wildly different moral rules in different places. Actually, they don't. And the more you really know about the history of the world and all of its literature, the more you actually see the sameness of human beings and what they know and how they fail to do what they know they should do. And that this is universal. Uh, human nature is universal. Everybody is sinful. And everybody knows that they're sinful. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we know it. Of course, only people who are drawn by God, who are regenerate, figure out how to solve that problem. But deep down, everybody knows that they're lacking. Everyone has that gnawing feeling of somehow, I need to justify my existence. I need to justify myself in some way. And so everybody wrestles with that, even people from ancient Sumeria and, you know, the the shadows of the Tian Shan mountains in Central Asia and the jungles of, of the Congo. People still have that experience everywhere you go. And all humans are made in the image of God. While we're totally depraved, while we're very corrupt, we're very evil, we're very selfish, we still have the damaged image of God that, that is within us. And so we're still extraordinary creatures extraordinary beings that in some ways reflect the attributes of God, the communicable attributes of God, albeit in damaged ways, very damaged. And yet, there's something extraordinary about human beings. You know, even if you were here last night for the big debate, even those atheists, I mean, wasn't there something about some of them that you could just kind of, you listen to them and you think, you know, this guy is really messed up, but what a neat guy. You know, there's something compellingly human about him. And, you know, we're all that way. We're all made in the image of God. You also discover human problems. You know, people have been dealing forever, with, well, not forever, for 7,000 years or however long we've been here. We've been dealing with the fact that we all die. We all struggle with sin. The problem of human government, the problem of human relationships, 
men and women, child rearing, the problem of suffering, disappointment. These things are part of the human condition, and we all deal with them. Also, Lewis says, and if you were interested in this, The Abolition of Man is really his book to go to about this. He says that education should also help fix our wiring. That, in, you know, we're all born with this innate knowledge of good and evil, Lewis believes. God has put in our minds this idea of the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong. He's put in our minds his own existence that we know, deep down, we know God exists. And we know things like we're supposed to keep our promises and, and that sort of thing. So he actually agrees kind of with the, the philosophy of Philip Melanchthon about this. And uh, Lewis says, though, that at a deep level, those things are true. It, it deep conscience, what the ancients called synderesis, we, we have all of that. But if you go up higher into our higher conscience, we can get our conscience really confused. Things that happen to us when we're children, the way we're raised, traumatic events, can mess up our wiring. So somebody gives you a Christmas present that you always wanted, and instead of feeling happy, you feel depressed. Somebody uh, you know who you really like gives you a hug, and instead of feeling happy, you, you feel uncomfortable. You know, there, there, sometimes our wiring is just confused. And Lewis says part of what a good education should do is it should help fix your wiring. It should correct the emotional responses that you have so that they're appropriate for the particular circumstances that you were in. So it should encourage things like the love of family, the love of your nation, the love of your neighbors. So it should kind of help you with that. It should sort of help your, your higher conscience to be rewired. And uh, it should, in a sense, help you become a, a nicer person. Lewis says, you know, things like education cannot make you good. Only God can do that. But education can make you nice, can make you easy to live with. And that's still helpful for your neighbors, so it's not a bad thing. Uh, also, the idea of ordering our loves. Education, good Christian education, can help us sort out which things are really more important than others, what, how we really ought to order things and how much we love what. Because, of course, obviously we should love God with all we have. But then God wants us to, in a sense, love other things in lesser ways. And anytime we get all of that out of order, it really messes us up. So this idea that Augustine has of ordering our loves is one of the goals of good education. And education should help produce what, uh, what Jesus calls a good eye in you. It should help you see things the way they really are. It should help you eliminate biases and prejudices like, you know, Jewish dislike of Samaritans and things like that. It should help you empathize with other people. It should help you to think less about yourself and more about other people, to become more grateful, more generous. Education should help you with that. It should also be a safeguard against deception. Lewis says the best safeguard against bad literature is a full experience of good. Just as real and affectionate acquaintance with honest people gives a better protection against rogues than habitual distrust of everyone. You know, so you can, you can avoid being taken in by con men by, in two ways. You can either never believe anyone which is not advisable, or you can learn to tell the difference between people who are con men and people who aren't. And uh, Lewis recommends knowing people who are decent, godly people in order to figure out how to tell one from the other. Uh, also, education helps us develop abilities for life. Uh, critical thinking, oral and written communication, discernment, wisdom, being able to answer all of the why questions. You know, in our civilization today, we have a tremendous emphasis on education to train you for jobs. So you go to school for four years, you major in something like nursing, where you spend all this time getting ready for a particular job, you graduate and end up becoming a shoe designer. 
you know, and you never do what you spent all this time training to do. Most people, they switch careers a couple times in their lives. And so it, it's kind of funny. But of course, what education can do is it can help you figure out, if you study the right things, why we should do particular things instead of other things. So classically, you know, education wasn't about how to make widgets, it was about whether you should make widgets and how many and why you would make them. So th these are actually much deeper, bigger questions and that's the sort of thing that you can uh, learn how to figure out through a good education. So background knowledge too, you know, so you can interact about different things with different people. You gotta know a little bit about everything. Uh, research skills, so you can find out the things you don't know when you need to know them. Uh, human interaction, an important part of education is learning to get along with other people. And a no, to know cultural references. You're not really literate unless you understand the things that people in your own culture talk about and why they talk about them. So it's kind of important, and education can help you with that. So good education also does a couple more things. It immunizes you against a variety of false beliefs. If you're really acquainted with what people believe and why they believe it, you're not gonna fall for some ridiculous idea simply because a professor is breathing down your neck and giving you all sorts of indoctrination. And of course, this happens to kids all the time. You know, they go off to college and they go to the public school and they get into their first philosophy class and you know the professor comes on strong about postmodernism you know how do you know how do you know that you know you don't really know that you know that you know and so you know they get all confused oh i don't how do i know anything i might not really exist you know and so it, it, they get confused easily and so a good education ought to acquaint you with all of the kinds of things people believe and why they believe them and why they're wrong and what you really ought to believe and why. And it helps you think through those things. So, you know, when, when somebody comes at you and they throw this new idea at you, you know, everything that exists is, is atoms. It's all material. It's all a material world. You can say, oh, that's just Lucretius. I've heard that before. No, not, not true, not true. <laughs> you know, so... It, it helps. Also, it helps you to know what when your culture is lying to you about the past, which our culture does a lot. You know, o over the centuries, people have developed these kind of programs of propaganda where they sort of tried to convince everybody of new ideas. And part of that was often to, to convince people that the things in the past were really very bad. You know, so if you read like Vasari's book about Renaissance art in Florence, Gothic art, very bad, very bad. And so, you know, if you look at, at books in the Enlightenment, you know, oh, the Middle Ages, those were terrible, terrible, dark, ignorant times. You know, and so everybody's always putting down the past. But to do that, they frequently tell fibs. You know, they don't tell you what, what John Calvin really said they tell you what, what they want you to believe, he said. And usually, it's not the same as what he really said. And so, for instance, you know, the, the whole myth of the flat earth. Nobody who was educated ever really believed the earth was flat. But sometime in the 1800s, somebody slipped that into this narrative about Columbus, and everybody came to believe it in the 1900s. But it was never true. Plato says the world said the world was round, and he wasn't the first people to, person to believe that. Educated people all thought the world was round. Cicero thought the world was spherical, and and that it was very large. In fact, he probably thought it was bigger than it really is, because he thought that the Roman Empire was a tiny, insignificant spot on the globe. So it, sometimes we're, we're led to believe crazy things. If you really read old books you discover the truth. You know, like another good one is Galileo. Everybody is told, oh, yeah, the church suppressed Galileo because he, he said that the sun was really the center of the... No, 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 no. Galileo got in trouble because he did a Protestant thing. He was talking in his book about biblical passages and what they meant. 
and he insulted the Pope. So between insulting the Pope and acting like a Protestant, that's really why he got in trouble. Had he not done those things, it, it, he would have skated. There wouldn't have been any trouble. So, well, and publishing in Italian instead of in Latin. That was the other, other thing that was uh, a problem. So all of those things are goals of good education. And Lewis would add three more, I think. He would say joy. Good education should build in you that longing that's really a longing for God. But everything that you experience that reflects him is something that's going to lead you to that. It's going to help you with that. Godly pleasure. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God has created for us to enjoy, provided we do it in the proper way and we pay for it in the proper way. And so godly pleasure. And good education helps you to know God better. And in a way, I think that's one of the things where I, I'm impressed by Lewis's own education and its effects in him. Because even though he's not the consummate theologian or the consummate uh, arguer for biblical inerrancy, what I can say about Lewis is I feel like he understands God's personality. He somehow senses and knows the way God is, that God is like this. And I think he usually gets that pretty right. So that's interesting. It's interesting. So those are our goals of a great book education. So now if, we got, if we've got great books, we've got goals of education. Now, what else do we have to ask to put all of this together? Well, something else we might say is, well, I mean, shouldn't we just read the Bible? I mean, all the things you've talked about, you can get all of that from the scriptures themselves. The scripture is the greatest book after all. It's the only one that's divinely inspired. And you know, it, it, it shows us the message of essential for salvation. It, it, it's easy if we just say, let's read the Bible. And it sounds really holy, doesn't it? You know, oh, let's just read the Bible. We'll ignore secular literature. It's secular. So it sounds really holy. But, you know, I think that, that God himself would suggest that we really ought to be more literate, that we ought to read other books too. Uh, Lewis says in Learning in Wartime that God calls us to do all we do to his glory and not just to limit our lives purely to Bible study or evangelism. And I think he's right. I think God calls people to do things that help other people, not only spiritually, but physically. You know, somebody has to make shoes and raise wheat and patch up broken arms. And it's better for Christians to do that than to leave everything to pagans. So we have to do other things. And life-saving, you know, Lewis gives this example in, in Learning Wartime. He says, life-saving is really important. You know, if you wanted to save people from drowning and storms off the coast of England, you might devote your life to life-saving, to having, you know, a station where they, they had stations where they had these boats. And when they saw a ship in trouble that was sinking, you know, or breaking apart, they would sail out in their lifeboats and they would rescue the people on board the ship. And that's a noble, wonderful thing. Lewis says it's great. But nobody could devote every minute of their waking life to life-saving and nothing else. Life-saving is something worth dying for. But Lewis says it's not something worth living for. You have to have more to life than just a particular activity. And so, you know, there's more to it. And he says we see this in every human endeavor. Even in wartime, some people need to go to college instead of being on the battlefield. And even in the trenches, people still tell jokes. They still comb their hair. They still do the things that humans have always done. And we, they still participate in human culture. And so it, we're going to have to do that. We're going to, humans are cultural beings. And so whether we like it or not, we're going to have a culture. And so Lewis says, then it isn't a choice of whether you're, just, you're going to have a culture or not. It's a question of whether you're going to have a good culture or not. And having a good culture requires dedicating yourself 
to occasionally interacting with things like good literature. And so this is an important thing. Lewis also says and points out that outside reading can help us in evangelism. You know, Paul, when he talked to the Athenians on uh, at the Areopagus, he quotes several of their own poets. Uh, so he's familiar with all of this literature of the pagan philosophers. That's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. So uh, education can be helpful. And we'll, we'll pause here to add an additional authority about this besides Lewis. Let me read you what John Calvin says about non-scriptural learning. He says uh, in the Institutes, he says, therefore, in reading profane authors, profane meaning not, not Christian, the admirable light of truth displayed in them should remind us that the human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still adorned and invested with admirable gifts from its creator. If we reflect that the Spirit of God is the only fountain of truth, we will be careful as we would avoid offending insult to, or offering insult to him, that is to God, not to reject or condemn truth wherever it appears. In despising the gifts, we insult the giver. How then can we deny that truth must have beamed on those ancient lawgivers who arrange civil order and discipline with so much equity? Shall we say that the philosophers in their exquisite researches and skillful descriptions of nature were blind? Shall we deny the possession of intellect to those who drew up rules for discourse and taught us how to speak in accordance with reason? Shall we say that those who by cultivation of the medical art expended their industry in our behalf were only raving? What shall we say of the mathematical sciences? Shall we deem them to be dreams of madmen? Nay, we cannot read the writings of the ancients on these subjects without the highest admiration, an admiration which their ex excellence will not allow us to withhold. But shall we deem anything to be noble and praiseworthy without tracing it to the hand of God? Far from us to be such ingratitude, an ingratitude not changeable even on heath or chargeable even on heathen poets who acknowledge that philosophy and laws and all useful arts were the invention of gods. Therefore, since it is manifest that men whom the scriptures term carnal, are so acute and clear-sighted in the investigation of inferior things, their example should teach us how many gifts the Lord has left in possession of human nature, notwithstanding of its having been despoiled of true good. Inst or, or, of true good. And this is from the Institute's book two, chapter two, paragraph 35. Uh, no, 15, excuse me. Uh, page 236 in Beveridge. Uh, and, you know, he's saying, look, it, God gave all sorts of things to mankind. And in the writings of the pagan philosophers, even though they don't have a clue about salvation, even though they're completely in darkness and bondage and dead through sin, nevertheless, God has given them an amazing amount of information and reasonable knowledge about all sorts of things that are inferior subjects. So even though their knowledge is twisted by their lack of uh, having a renewed mind, nevertheless, there's a lot we can learn from them that can profit us. So this is what Calvin had said about it. So must good literature be right? That's then another question. We, we look at all these books that are written by people who, who may not have been uh, regenerate, who may not have been believers. We know that their presuppositions are in many ways in error. So we know that everything they say is going to be tainted in some way by sin and by error. So are those things still of any value to us? Well, Lewis argues that they are. He rejects the idea that to be a good literature, a book must be simply good. 
that, that it must meet a standard of divine perfection in some way. He says, uh, we do not value books merely for truths about life. We do not value books simply as an aid to culture. Other than the Bible, no book will be all true and correct. And he says, nevertheless, books still must be received and understood. Well, why? If, if a book isn't going to be purely accurate, if we're going to have to carefully parse between truth and error, why are we going to bother with this? What is it then that is compelling to us about literature that isn't going to be accurate? And we might include not only pagan literature, but, but literature by people who are, say, theologically darkened, you know, Arminians and people like that. So just, yeah. Anyway, so uh, reasons to study the great books. You know, we forget that most of the great books before the New Testament have been considered great because they foreshadow biblical truths. Uh, when people looked back at ancient literature in the Middle Ages and in the, uh, the Renaissance, they did not look back and say, oh, you know, these people just came up with all these things that were true in their literature, in their pagan literature, right out of the blue. How clever of them to invent it. No, they thought if it's true, God must have somehow illumined their minds and put that there for the benefit of mankind as part of his common grace, as a, a gift to humans, so that even though they're totally depraved, things wouldn't be as bad as they could be. So there's always restraining human evil and the results that it can have to some degree. It's never giving us what we really deserve. And so Lewis is, is suggesting that, uh, that, this is, that this medieval belief that things in the past, God used them for the good of mankind, he's suggesting that this is, is a truth. It's interesting, you even see this in the book of Jeremiah, or, yeah, I think, is it Jeremiah or Isaiah? I should have written this in my notes, where it talks about uh, how farmers harvest farm, that they know the difference between how you harvest rye and how you harvest wheat, and what you do with spices like cumin and what you do with other kinds of things. And it says, this is from the Lord. You know, it's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you what to do with wheat. But God gives this knowledge to farmers, and he has for a long time. So uh, there's this, this suggestion then that even a lot of pagan works foreshadow biblical truths. It's interesting, Augustine of Hippo thought that the Greeks seemed to know so much that they must have actually got a clandestine copy of the Old Testament, and they just weren't giving attribution, you know. So possible, it's possible. So we also tend to forget that most of the great books written after the New Testament expound or discuss biblical truths. Most of the people in Western Europe, if we'd asked them, you know, are, are you a Christian? For most of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and even most of the Enlightenment, most people would have said, oh, of course. And they, if we, they would have said, well, what does that mean? They'd have said, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is, is God. I believe that he died for our sins. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe that this is all in the Bible. And so they might have been theologically confused in other ways. But they probably would have had at least that much. So a lot of these books have been written by people who would have called themselves Christians. And that's something worth remembering as well. Now, some of them are terribly confused. I mean, it, Hume or Kant, they're just very confused. And yet you kind of have to read those books, if for nothing else, so that you can refute them. Uh, of the books that are not foreshadowing Christianity or in some way uh, being Christian, you still have to read a lot of the other ones because you have to know how to argue against them. You have to know what their arguments are and why they're wrong. It's, it's good to read Hume and figure out why he isn't right. Then when you go away to college or your kids go away to college and, you know, the professor comes up to them and says, well, you don't actually know that that billiard ball is moving because it was hit by the other billiard ball. How do you know that it caused it? Maybe it's just a coincidence. So you, you, you know to laugh at him, you know, if, if you've really thought about this. But a lot of people, you know, they hear Hume's arguments and they're, ooh, 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't know what causes things. Hmm. So, you know, it can, get, it can really freak people out if they haven't thought about it. So it's worth refuting these things. You know, Lewis in Learning in Wartime, he says, to be ignorant and simple now, not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground, would be to throw down our weapons and betray our uneducated brethren who have under God no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. And so Lewis is very definite that we have to learn about the bad philosophy in order to refute it. We have to be able to defend others and help them to understand what's true. And you know how, how true this is. We see this so much in our own time. We live in a day and age in which bad philosophy is quite literally destroying our civilization. Uh, Nietzsche, he was really, his philosophy directly influenced both the First and the Second World War. No Nietzsche, it would have been very different. Uh, Marx and all the wars of between the 40s and the 80s, you know, do you know how many wars around the world that the Russians funded during the Cold War? Once the Soviet Union fell, the number of global conflicts fell by, by a vast amount. I, think it's, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's something like 75%. It went from like 200 global conflicts to 50 in a few years. Why? Well, because they were passing out money to everybody who had a grievance and was willing to go kill people about it. So Marxism, tremendous influence. And today, Heidegger, the Muslim Brotherhood, all these ideas of radical Islam, these things are you know, creating ISIS and all these other radical Muslim groups, the Muslim Brotherhood, here in the United States, CARE, all these groups that are radical and are radicalizing Muslims and getting them to run out and blow things up. And uh, that too is the result of bad ideas. And of course, Antonio Gramsci and the Frankfurt School and their effect of bringing the effects of government Marxism into the American university and then in turn into the American government. You know, our government is basically run by people who are following, whether they know it or not. I think they know it, but most people don't credit them with knowing it. The, the agenda of Antonio Gramsci, obscure Italian neo-Marxist, but told people to do exactly what they're doing. So it's kind of interesting. And so ideas have consequences. They have a lot of consequences. And uh, if you don't refute them, they have a way of coming back and, and biting you. And this has happened in America for a long time. You know, we, we fought the Civil War over slavery, but then we didn't follow the scriptures and get rid of it and start loving our neighbor the way we were supposed to we instead allowed the insidiousness of racism to continue to grip America. And so in effect, it's like the North lost the Civil War. Everything became horrible. And we're still today fighting in the law, fighting in culture, fighting in politics, all of the effects of all of those years of racism that are so unchristian and unbiblical. So it's really a horrible, perverse thing Bad ideas really, really, really hurt you. And they take their revenge on you down the road. And so you got to deal with them and root them out and bring every thought into submission to Christ. And that's what a good education that discusses the big issues in the great books really does. So another thing that Lewis would point out is that all of this, this idea of going to great books instead of to textbooks, is in accord with the spirit of the Reformation. You know, that was what first brought Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon together, is that they both believed that you should get rid of reading the commentaries on the commentaries on the glossators, and instead read the original text in the original language. And so the spirit of the Reformation was very much, let's just go back to the primary sources and what they say instead of all of this commentary on commentary on commentary, which ends up being very colored and highly rationalized and, 
and very stilted. Uh, so original texts are better. They, uh, they tell us uh, uh, things more clearly. They're usually easier to read. They're usually better written. And the, they're pure and more accurate than secondhand information. So Lewis says in, on the reading of old books, he says, the simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, yet a very great, great deal of what Plato said. But hardly anyone can understand some books on modern Platonism. And this is very true. This is very true. Uh, also, great books education helps us cast out the spirit of the age. Casting out the zeitgeist is an important uh, role of this. Uh, in On the Reading of Old Books, Lewis repeats one of his common themes, that the only way to see the truth clearly is to be cured of the blindness of our own time and place. He says, the only palliative is to keep the clear sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And so uh, every period in history has its own blindnesses, its own biases, its own ways of seeing things in a certain way. And we have this very much in our own time, and we're completely blind to much of it. You know, my students easily have this, have certain mental habits that they've absorbed from culture and they don't even think about it. Uh, an example would be that they equate a person's beliefs with their identity as a human being. So if I say, oh, I'm sorry, I think you're wrong about that, they feel like that is a personal attack. Now, People at other times wouldn't have necessarily had the same reaction, but they clearly do. They think, oh yeah, if, if, if you say to, to somebody that, you know, oh, you shouldn't be uh, uh, engaging in this in behavior X because the Bible tells you not to, it's not just, you know, criticizing their behavior. This is an attack on them as a human being. And I, I have to say, really, why? You know, if I'm going the wrong way, shouldn't I want to know I'm going the wrong way? Why is my personhood tied up in my errors? So, and yet our culture very much does that. So it is by seeing things through the eyes of other authors of us and beasts that we can in effect live in other ages and begin to see things more clearly to escape from some of the biases and prejudices of our own time, to see how other people saw things. Now, we'll see what their big mistakes were. You know, you step back into literature of 400 years ago and you start reading it, there are glaring things that jump out at you. Think, oh, how could they believe that? But you know, if we were able to bring them up, up to our time and bring them here, they'd react the same way. They'd, they'd be saying, you do what to unborn babies? What is wrong with you people? You know, they would really explode on impact with, with a lot of the things in our culture too. But when you read all these books over the ages, you begin to get a bigger perspective on things, to see things more clearly. So Lewis says a work of literature is both logos and poema, uh, these two different words. It's communication and art to oversimplify the, the meaning loaded in those terms. He says, when we receive a great work as art, it has a transformative effect on us. It edifies, it provides an enlargement of our being. He says, to go out of the self, to correct its provincialism and heal its loneliness. It admits us to experiences other than our own. Lewis goes on, he says, like the night sky in the Greek poem, I see with a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, in, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself. I am never more myself than when I do. So this is really his point, that when we receive a book, when we enter into it, we sort of walk a mile in the other fellow's shoes. We begin to see the world the way he sees it, 
to feel what he feels, to know what she knows, to experience what she experienced. And so we, we begin to sort of transcend ourselves and our own experience and our own time and our own culture. And we begin to experience of something of the rest of humanity. Now, of course, we do this interpersonally when we talk to each other all the time. Good interpersonal relationships involve listening to the other person, even if we disagree with them. We know that loving another person means listening to them and getting to know what they think and why they think it. And if you're going to, to be used by the Holy Spirit as one of the means that he uses to draw people to himself, you're probably going to have to listen to somebody in order to witness with them, in order to teach them, in order to disciple them. And this is, is part of what you do when you read the great books. You're really listening to another human being. You're entering in to part of what they have experienced. And so this gives us a communion, not merely with living men, but with all the men and women that we, we read. It also, in effect, gives us a kind of communion not merely with humans, but with the image of God in humans. So by reading the great books properly, with discernment, with informed by the scriptures, and though we get to know through it, we, we get to know God a little bit better. Uh, we get to know more about God and the people he created so we become part of what Mortimer Adler called the great conversation, uh, a way to know uh, the great men and women of the ages, to essentially have these, these people like C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams and J.R. Tolkien and uh, uh, Richard Hooker and uh, all these people from the past as our friends in a sense. So the great books enable us to do this. Uh, Lewis does say there are dangers, though. So this is the good thing, that you can enter into human experience, you can get all of this out of it, you can learn how to see things the way they really are, but there are risks. One of them is that uh, you could become proud. And this is a big problem. You know, you read a lot of books, you begin to think, oh, yes, I read a lot of books. You know, and you get in trouble. And I've seen students come out of great book programs at different schools with this, this problem that they think, you know, oh yes, I'm a graduate of the X honors program and so I know more than you do about everything. And you know, you gotta avoid that because it's just a terrible trap. Pride is a terrible sin. And so you, you gotta be humble about it. Also, we may neglect the living. You know, I think about uh, uh, Dickens' A Christmas Carol, you know, where Ebenezer Scrooge is looking back at his childhood, and there he is in the schoolhouse reading a book when everybody else is out playing. You know, he says, oh, yes, those were my friends, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves and all. Yeah, yeah, we have to pay attention to the living people, too, not just the ones that wrote things. And uh, also, sometimes we can have poisonous motives, uh, Lewis talks about the inner circle a lot, you know, that we want to try to get into this, this important group, the, the movers and shakers, and that's a bad motive. It only ends up disappointing in the end and leads to bad things. Or we want to read books in order to use them, you know, so that we can cl say clever things at parties and what have you, and that's, that's also not a good motive. Uh, or to reinforce our identity, uh, and the screw tape letters, you know, talks about that. And so we, we, we don't want to just get it trapped in those kinds of things. Also, uh, quality depends in part on which books you read and in what order you read them. I think Lewis was m less afraid of this than I am from experience. There are great book programs that are very, very, very Roman Catholic, for example. There are some schools that if you go there, somehow they, they forgot to include anything by any reformer in the great books. Suspicious, very suspicious, you know. And of course, if you don't read any Luther or Calvin or, or uh, any of these other reformers, this is a huge deficit in your education. So it's, it's a very bad thing. 
And uh, so having a Romanist list of great books can be very misleading. There's also, there are also places where they kind of have the progressive agenda in great books. The books that they choose are all designed to convince you that things have gone from the primitive stage through all these steps where they got better and better and better, you know. Everything is improving all the time. The more secular and the more godless we become, the better civilization gets. If you ever read the Harvard classics, they're kind of edited that way to convince you of this progressivist agenda that everything is improving through a dialectical process, you know. And uh, that's propaganda. But <laughs> if you pick your books wrong, you'll likely end up thinking that. So it's important to have read the right books in the right order. So those are dangers. Also, we might not see the truth. We need to have people who, who talk with us and who are experienced and who guide us as we do this. Uh, we need to have people who prevent us from, from believing a lie. But even in bad books, there's always, there's always a little bit of, of truth. I like to say that a book is like a mousetrap, and there's always a little cheese in the mousetrap. So the, the clever mouse knows how to you know, spring the trap without being in it and then go get the cheese. And so then you get all the cheese and you don't get caught in the mouse trap. So you've got to be careful about books, but you can still get something out of them. Uh, and uh, there's a little cheese in, in every trap. So the weight of the good, I think, if, you, if we take a look at the risks, we look at all these benefits, you know, seeing things more the way they really are, uh, transcending our individuality without losing it, getting to know more about God and about mankind, equipping ourselves to take place in the forum of ideas, all these things outweigh the risks. I think it's worth it. And so I think that great books, education, is a, a pressing need within the Christian world. And I think it's a good thing. You might say, well, but it sounds risky. Well, I think that God calls us to moral adventure. Remember the parable of the, of the talents where, you know, Jesus talks about the, 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 the king who goes away and he gives one guy, you know, three talents of gold, three years income of gold, and another guy two years of however many it was, and another one just one. And the first two, they go out and they invest them and they make more. And the other one, he digs a hole and he buries it and hides it very carefully. And then when the, the ruler comes back, he, he grills the guys. You know, they come in and they offer what they have. And the, the first two, he, they, the, one of them earned back 10, you know, 10 more talents. And so he gives him rule over 10 cities. And the second one did almost as well, and he rewards him. And the, the last one comes and says, well, you know, I was afraid I might lose it. And you're a very stingy fellow. And so here's your talent back. I made sure it was safe played it safe. I hid it in the ground. He says, you foolish servant. Shouldn't you have at least put it in the bank so it would earn interest? And so God doesn't want us to not take risks. He wants us to live a life of moral adventure, getting out there, getting our hands dirty, and making the tough choices, and doing the tough activities. And I think learning about the great books, interacting with the great ideas, is a part of that. So, thank you. That's the talk. <laughs>